HP, but okay. So it's like sort of a backup at this point. Or will yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll what I'll do is that I'll just play it. Uh, uh, quite yeah. a bit of it was uh, recorded uh, just in case. Uh, my Wi-Fi goes down and all, so I can send it over to you and you can play it. So it's kind of recorded. Right, no, you're here, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Hi, hi, Kulvinder. Hi, hello, hi. Uh, let me just uh, minimize this. Uh, well, what happened here? Hmm. I think your screen is frozen, sir. I don't know. Yeah. I'll just do a double click on the screen. Yeah, I'm just uh, on the screen. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think Amol, Amol. In, Dr. Chaudhary isn't here. Sir. Rather shoddy, I Hi, I'm all. Hi, sir. How are you? I am good. Fine, fine. <laughs> all well. Hi, Matthew. Hi, but Matthew. Nakpur is uh, in the green zone. Luckily, Nakpur is in the green zone. Yes. So we have less than 1.5% of patients. Yes. We are still in the orange, but hopefully we will turn green soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm. I'm uh, Matthew. How are you? I'm fine. Kerala is ah. getting better now. Still a lot of COVID cases, but getting better. Ah. How is Kerala? Kerala is getting better. Kerala is, Kerala is getting better, but still a lot of cases. Okay. And Kochi in particular? Kochi, uh, there are cases, uh, but not uh, it's manageable. Okay, okay. Great, great. Dr. Chandrasekhar and TSC is uh, TSC not on. I don't know. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yeah, can. Hi, hi, Shrikant. Hi, hi, Kulvinder. Hi, Kulvinder. Yeah. These electronic worlds, we are old timers for that. You guys yeah, are pretty yeah. young. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, for the first two webinars, we had a lot of difficulty. The people, uh, the per presenter could not log in. And uh, that was a problem. So there was a delay of four to five minutes. So okay. we thought that let us first see whether you can log in and share your screen. There was a problem in sharing screen, you know. <laughs> I see. Yeah. I don't know. It's a Zoom thing or maybe an American Zoom platform versus Indian platform is <laughs> something. Uh, no, when you share your screen, there are two side boxes yeah. that uh, I remember I was uh, talking for that uh, Korean Society of GI Endoscopy. And if you don't click that sound box, your yeah. presentation goes without sound. Uh, they kind of taught me how to do it. At least that I have been using now. Um, so you press <laughs> the share screen and on the side, there's video share and audio share. You have to press both. Huh. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come on automatically. You have to physically do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's 730 now. We can start the introductions and then get going in the next few minutes. So that it's not too late in India for everyone. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all. Okay. That do you want to start, or should it, you want me to? I can introduce everyone. Yeah, yeah, you can start, Saurav. Okay. All right. Hi. Good evening, everyone. I'm Saurav Mukhevar. It's a pleasure to have everyone here on a Sunday evening. Uh, we have a lot of people logging in. We have about 180 participants, so that's uh, it's a pretty good turnout for a Sunday evening. Uh, thank you all of you for logging in and sparing your time today. It's uh, it's nice to see uh, Dr. Bape, Dr. Philip, Dr. Dua, uh, Dr. TSC. I'm not, I'm not able to see you here, but uh, I'll start with the introductions and then um, hand over the proceedings to Dr. Dua for the talk. So we have today Dr. Kulvinder Dua, who is a professor of medicine and pediatrics and the chief of the division of gastroenterology and hepatology as well as the Director of Advanced Endoscopy Program at Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, USA. Dr. Dua completed his medical training in uh, India. In fact, he was in GMC Nagpur, 
So we are uh, all from the same medical college. Uh, he did his further training in the United Kingdom. In 1992, he moved to the US and joined the faculty at MCW in Milwaukee. His primary interest has been advanced interventional endoscopy. He's an inventor and has several patents and FDA clear devices. His other area of interest is studying aerodigestive tract physiology and pathophysiology supported by the NIH. He has over 200 publications. He is on editorial board for several journals. Recently, he was recognized in the scientific community for having regrown the first human esophagus in vivo using the principles of regenerative medicine. This was published in Lancet. Hopefully, Dr. Dua can enlighten us on that a little bit today. He's involved in several philanthropic works in countries such as Ethiopia, Sudan, Nigeria, India, Ecuador, in tra training local doctors in uh, gastroenterology and endoscopy. He's been instrumental in helping us set up our advanced endoscopy program at Midas, and we are really thankful to him for the same. He has uh, uh, several awards, including the prestigious ASG Master of Endoscopy Award, the BJ Vakil Memorial Gold Medal, the Pune Oration Gold Medal, Soli Mark Oration of South Africa, and in 2017, USA Healthcare Hero Award. He's also been inducted in the first batch of top, top 60 endoscopists in the world. So thank you, Dr. Dua, for being here. Uh, and we also have Dr. Matthew Phillip, who is joining us from uh, Kochi. He's the president of the Society of uh, Gastrointestinal Endoscopy India, as well as he's the he head of department at Lisi Institute of Gastroenterology at Lisi Hospital in Kochi. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also have Dr. Amol Bape, who is a consultant gastroenterologist and interventional endoscopist uh, and chief of Shivanand Desai Center for Digestive Disorders at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital and Research Center in Pune. He's a surgeon by training, but his clinical and research interests include advanced interventional endoscopy. He has authored more, and more than 135 peer-reviewed publications and contributed to several book chapters. He has reported pioneering work in the third space endoscopy, role of G-POEM and uh, PREM, which is P-R-E-M for uh, uh, Hertzsprung's disease. He has been the recipient of the Pioneer in Gastroenterology Award by the WEO. Uh, he also is the founder and managing trustee of Foundation for Research and Education Endoscopy, a nonprofit organization that supports training and research in endoscopy. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have Dr. Uh, Professor uh, T.S. Chandrasekhar from uh, Chennai. He is the chairman and chief interventional gastroenterologist at Med India Hospitals in Chennai. He is the recipient of many awards, including the Padma Shri Award in Gastroenterology by the Government of India. He's uh, the Master of World Gastroenterology Organization. Uh, and he has delivered more than 500 talks, organized hundreds of meetings, uh, faculty at more than 80 endoscopy workshop, and he has trained over 750 doctors. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. And then we also have Dr. Adars Chaudhary, who is joining us from Delhi. He is the head of uh, Department of GI Surgery at Medanta Hospital, who is uh, very well experienced with GI surgeries. Uh, and I thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. I don't see him, but hopefully he should be in soon. Okay, and with all this, I'll hand over the proceedings to Dr. Dua. Yes, and uh, okay, I have to stop screen sharing. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Saurabh, for that uh, kind introduction. And it's indeed an honor and privilege to be amongst these esteemed group of panelists. And uh, I welcome all of them. Uh, and I also want to welcome all the people who have logged in. So I'm going to share my screen now. I recorded my talk uh, previously, just in case uh, something goes wrong, then I can forward it to Saurabh and he can play it. Uh, so most of my talk is recorded, but at the end, I'll take questions. Hello, good evening, India time. It's morning for me. I want to thank Saurabh Mukkewar for having given me this honor and opportunity to speak today. And I also want to thank all the panelists, uh, Matthew, TSC, Amul, and Adarsh for spending some of their precious Sunday evening time with me. I am Kulvinda Dua at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I am professor of medicine and pediatrics, and I'm also professor at the Graduate School of Medical Sciences. Today, I'll be talking on endoscopic therapy for refractory benign esophageal stricture, what's new. And at the end of my talk, I'll also devote some time 
on how to prevent these strictures from formation after procedures like endoscopic submucosal dissection. I have the following disclosures. These are some FDA approved devices, none of which I will be discussing in my talk. Let us first define what we are dealing with. Refractory benign esophageal strictures are complex esophageal strictures that are generally over 2 cm in length. They can be tortuous, multifocal, and generally a standard 9.5 mm diameter scope cannot pass through the stricture. The common causes for these strictures are corrosives, radiation injuries, post-surgical, post-endoscopic mucosal resection or submucosal dissection, photodynamic therapy, pill injury, and as you'll notice over here, peptic causes for these strictures are rare unless there is superimposed pill injury. An exception could be an anastomotic stricture, which is short, not long, not tortuous, not multifocal, but they can be very fibrotic like a concrete or they can be very elastic like an elastic band that you stretch and it recalls back and therefore they also fall into the refractory group. Let me start off by presenting this interesting case to emphasize the point on what we should be defining as refractory. This 78 year old female presumed to have peptic stricture despite being on proton pump inhibitors, had undergone 15 dilations over a period of 11 months at an outside hospital. The first thing that caught my attention was that how are the PPIs going through the stricture? And therefore, we should keep this in mind that if the patient is on a PPI medication, we could then consider changing it to the liquid formulation. The second thing that happened is that we found out that this patient is on a potassium pill, which was also causing superimposed pill injury. When the pill was stopped and the PPI liquid formulation was given, the inflammation healed and subsequent to that, the patient had only two dilations and was told to call back if her symptoms of dysphagia returns and she's over 12 months out and we have not heard from her and I know that she's still alive. So this lady had a peptic stricture with superimposed pill injury and responded very well to dilation and it was not a refractory stricture. Keep in mind that there are many conditions that can cause stricturing that are treatable like eosinophilic esophagitis and should not be mistaken for refractory benign esophageal strictures. So what is refractory benign esophageal stricture by definition, since many of us are doing studies on these patients and we have to have a consistent definition. Coachman described this as being a fibrotic restriction with no major motility disorder, no ongoing inflammation, no extrinsic compression, and inability to achieve a diameter of 14 millimeters despite five dilation sessions at two week intervals or if you do achieve a diameter of 14 millimeter, you cannot maintain that diameter and the patient requires one dilation every month. This 14 millimeter was picked up because that was thought to be what is required for normal swallowing, but I have certain issues with this because if a person cannot swallow his own saliva and I dilate that patient to 12 millimeters and now he can drink a milkshake, I think that's a good response and improves quality of life. So every patient should be taken on a case by case basis. For example, this patient of mine with head and neck cancer had a tight hypopharyngeal stricture, barely two millimeters in diameter, and he could hardly handle his own saliva. We dilated the stricture with a balloon to eight millimeters and based on the formula on area of a circumference equals to pi r square, we increased the circumference from 3.14 to 50.24, which is a 16 fold increase in the area of the circumference. Following this, he could handle liquid diets like milkshakes and soft diets, and this greatly improved his quality of life despite we not going up to 14 millimeters. The more we push it, the more we risk perforating these patients, which could be a disaster when the whole area surrounding this region is fibrotic. 
Having said that, we should still try to achieve a luminal diameter of 14 millimeters or more and then try to maintain this diameter without subjecting the patient to frequent dilation. Ironically, although these patients are referred to us as failed endoscopic dilation, endoscopic dilations are still the first line of treatment that we adopt at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So what's the difference? What we do is that we dilate these patients every week till we reach a diameter of 14 millimeters or more. And then at each dilation, we gauge how much the stricture has regressed, namely two step forward, one step back, and we keep going on. And based on that, we increase the frequency between dilation until the patient reaches a stage where he or she calls back whenever dysphagia symptoms return. So this is kind of a little bit of an aggressive frequent dilation protocol, but then we do have patients where we may find that they go two step forward and every week they come back two step and we are not winning. So in these patients, we go with other interventions such as needle knifing, stenting, etc., which I'll talk about later. The two common type of dilators are the bougie and the balloon. And although many of us prefer to use the balloon because it exerts pure radial forces, compared to a bougie that exerts radial and longitudinal forces in expert hands, both of them are safe. However, one point I would like to bring up over here is that in patients where we expect long or multifocal strictures, such as after radiation or corrosive injury, don't forget there could be areas in the esophagus that are below 14 millimeters in diameter such as this area, which is around 11 millimeter, which can be easily missed by an endoscope, which is 9.5 millimeter in diameter. Hence, if we use balloon, we may not recognize this area and only dilate the tight region and the patient will continue to have dysphagia. In these patients, I prefer to use a bougie that will be dilating the whole esophagus from the UES to the LES and therefore, I'll be guaranteed that I would have covered area that my endoscope did not recognize. Newer types of balloons are coming out. We in the past had used balloons that were coated with steroids, but in this study from uh, uh, Wang uh, from Mayo Clinic uh, just presented at DDW, they used paclitaxel coated balloon, which they placed across the stricture and distended it anywhere from 12 to 18 millimeters and kept it distended for five minutes so that the drug can percolate into the tissue. And then the patients were followed up till one year and repeat endoscopy was performed one month after the initial dilation and then an upper GI fluoroscopic examination at six months and 12 months. They had nine patients, eight of whom had peptic strictures and one had eosinophilic esophagitis. As expected, after drug-coated balloon dilation, the stricture diameter significantly improved and so did the dysphagia score improved, although there was not much gain in weight, but at least the patients were not losing weight. I was asked to give an expert commentary on this study my problem with this study is that the number of patients enrolled are too small and they did not include patients with corrosive injuries, radiation injuries, post-surgery or EST patients. And we all know from experience, dilating patients with peptic strictures or eosinophilic esophagitis, we get good response either way with a standard balloon or a drug-coated balloon. So further randomized studies are required involving patients with other etiologies before we can generalize this study to everybody. While we are still on the topic of dilation, I would like to bring up some unique situations like patients with head and neck cancer, where our speech language pathologists will tell you that the patient also has a defective pump, namely a weak or a leaking oropharyngeal swallowing mechanism. However, 
my opinion is that we should still dilate these patients despite a defective swallowing mechanism because we have learned from cardiologists that when you decrease the peripheral vascular resistance, the cardiac output increases. So if there is a blocked pipe and the swallowing mechanism is trying to push food through the block pipe and at the same time the mechanism is weak or leaky and the stuff is leaking out from the nostrils if you decrease the after load and dilate this area you may reduce the leakage and a weak pump will then propagate food more in the right direction or the path of least resistance and less out from the nasal cavity so my suggestion is that do dilate them at least once or twice and then repeat the swallowing study and see how they are performing. For example, this patient of mine with head and neck cancer had reduced lingual force. His velopharyngeal closure was defective. And as a result of that, material was leaking out through his nostril. And he of course had a very tight hypopharyngeal stricture. We kept dilating him to a reasonable size, which was eight millimeters, the picture that I showed you earlier on. And within two months, as you noticed, that even though he still had a reduced velopharyngeal closure, there was no more nasal regurgitation because now the path of least resistant was towards the esophagus and not the nostril. Another unique situation that we face with these patients is that some of them may have a complete closure at the pharynx and the upper esophageal level and nothing goes down like a guide wire from the top. So in these patients, we do what is called the rendezvous technique where we come with a thin scope through the G-tube site up into the esophagus. We have another operator who has placed a scope from the mouth into the pharynx. We look at the light, puncture the septum, pass a guide wire, reestablish communication and then go on the dilation path. I have a beautiful video of this. If you have time, I can show it to you if you are interested at the end of my talk. Now, what if our aggressive Medical College of Wisconsin dilation protocol fails? What can we do next? So conceptually speaking, if we distend a balloon across the stricture for two minutes or even five minutes, and if it gives relief for a week or two, how about distending the balloon continuously around the clock for 12 weeks? Will we get a longer duration of relief? And if yes, how is this possible? Self-expanding esophageal stents can be used as a dilator. And while they are in place, the patient can also continue eating. The only prerequisite is that the stent should be removed at some point in time nobody knows how long two weeks four weeks six weeks or eight weeks hence the stent has to be fully covered and the only stent that has been approved in the u.s for benign indication is the fully covered self-expanding plastic stent the idea is that while the stent is in place and it is stretching the stricture it is also remolding tissue and hence when the stent is removed not only is the stricture dilated, but the tissue is remolded. And then we hope that this stays open. Earlier studies that came out from Europe, from Italy and from Belgium showed a good success rate of 80% with a very low complication rate of around 6%, which was very encouraging. But subsequently, there were studies that came out from USA that showed exactly the reverse. A very low success rate of 6% and a very high complication rate of around 80%. So there was this confusion of what was going on and it appears that in the initial studies, true refractory esophageal strictures were not included. And therefore, if one would have included peptic strictures in the study group, they would have definitely have a good response compared to say corrosive or radiation strictures. So we did the first prospective non-randomized study on 40 patients and the pendulum from one extreme to the other came to around about 
39-40% success rate with around a quarter of these patients going into some sort of complication, most of which was related to migration. Unfortunately, self-expanding plastic stents are not much used nowadays because there are several issues with these stents. They do not come preloaded. The delivery system itself can be very thick, ranging from 12 to 14 millimeters. Due to significant foreshortening, the deployment can be erratic. There is significant chest pain because of strong radial forces and there's a high migration rate. Hence, nowadays we are exclusively using fully covered expandable metal stents like the Evolution fully covered stent or the other varieties available in the market. And looking at several studies, the success rate of these fully covered metal stent when used off label for benign refractory esophageal stricture is around about 58% with lower success rates when deployed near the cervical esophagus. Major complications such as bleeding, perforation, reflux, especially in the cervical area when the material can come into the pharynx is around 9% and there is still a very high migration rate of 24%. One may argue that the migration could be a good effect of the stent and the stricture is dilated and hence the stent migrates and therefore should not be counted as a complication. Since they are fully covered, even if they migrate, they can be removed. Again, none of these expandable metal stents that are fully covered are FDA approved for removable indications and therefore have to be used off label. What about using stents that we don't even have to remove? These are the biodegradable stents that are made of polylactide or polydioxone that get metabolized by our Krebs cycle and therefore based on the way the stent is designed, it can get metabolized in one month, two months, three months and can be used for refractory benign esophageal stricture. The study that came out from Europe, which was a two center study on 22 patients followed up for one year. The technical success in placing these stents was 100% and endoscopy done at three months showed all the stents had fragmented and bioabsorbed. The dysphagia score improvement was significant and at one year follow-up, 46% of these patients were dysphagia free. Complications included the usual, the chest pain, migration and bleeding. A recent study that was published in the journal Endoscopy was a randomized controlled multicenter study where refractory behind esophageal strictures were originally dilated to 16 millimeters and above and then a biodegradable stent was placed in an around 32 patients and in the control group only dilatation was done without a stent. What was found is that the need for repeat dilatation in the group that got the biodegradable stent was significantly less. Basically it was zero at three month follow up compared to the group that did not receive the biodegradable stent. But around six months in both the group, the dilatations required to keep the stricture open was similar in the two group. Although the p-value was not significant, but the biodegradable stent was associated with stent occlusion. In two patients, there was a tracheoesophageal fistula that developed and the stent migrated in one patient compared to the control group in whom there were two perforations related to the dilation. Since I deal with a lot of patients with hypopharyngeal and upper esophageal strictures from head and neck cancer, the question becomes that can we place stents in the upper esophageal region, even bridging the upper esophageal sphincter into the hypopharynx? The answer is yes, as for example, in this particular case, where we placed a stent across the UES with the upper end of the stent parked precisely at the level of the interarytenoid fold so as to not interfere with the movements of the epiglottis. The stent was in place for four and a half years, more so for regenerative purposes in this particular case. 
they are special stents out from Korea where the upper flange of the stent is smaller compared to the lower flange and these are used for the hypopharyngeal region and worst situations you can put a Montgomery Mary tube where the top end is like a funnel and this end is inserted into the esophagus and this part is lying in the hypopharynx so that the patient can at least drink liquids. So what about anastomotic strictures that can be elastic like a band so that when you dilate them, they just recoil back immediately or they can be very fibrotic, but yet they are short and hence stents tend to migrate. Although recently lumen opposing metal stents are being tried for this location. These strictures can be cut with a needle knife as is being shown in this video. By cutting it, you can cut the elastic band or the fibrosis. You can cut in many directions. It doesn't have to be in the quadrants itself. You try to cut up to the wall of the esophagus as much as you can. Of course, the more closer you go to the wall, there is a risk of perforation. After cutting it, some people recommend in a day or two to bring the patient back and dilate this area. I sometimes cut it aggressively and place a stent. Several studies have shown the benefit of using electrocautery in treating these kind of strictures. This study from Belgium showed a 100% response rate with one session of electrocautery in short strictures and around three sessions required for strictures that were longer in length, anywhere from 1.5 to 5 centimeters. People have used endoscopic ultrasound to guide the depth and the extent of incision. I find it very cumbersome. If there's any concern of a perforation or a micro perforation, I tend to place a lumen opposing metal stent. For those of you all who are not used to using needle knives, you can use an endoscopic scissor or you can even use a jumbo forceps and bite the circumference of the stricture and then dilate it. This is an interesting case of mine. Patient had esophageal cancer followed by esophagectomy with colon interposition and unfortunately developed colon cancer in the interposed colon. He then had that resected and underwent a gastric pull-up surgery, which unfortunately led to a very tight anastomotic stricture. So what I did in this particular case is that I aggressively cut this stricture to the extent that I was kind of worried that I may have had a micro perforation. So after cutting it aggressively, I could pass my scope through this area into the pulled up stomach, placed a guide wire, and over a guide wire, I deployed a fully covered expandable esophageal stent. I did not use a lumen opposing metal stent because the stricture was around three centimeters in length and therefore I used the other traditional fully covered stent. This stent was placed in for around two weeks during which it not only sealed any micro perforation but it also tore that area that I had cut more and eventually dilated that stricture. So talking about the MCW protocol that we follow, we dilate these patients every week as we described before. If that doesn't work, we go for other intervention. And what is very important that after we apply other interventions that I described, we go back to weekly dilations that many centers don't do. We don't want to lose out on the gains we made with other interventions. And it is interesting that some patients who failed frequent dilation after we apply other interventions now start responding. So this is kind of what the MCW protocol is. We did a study on this and we presented it at DTW. We had two groups of patients. Group A where patients referred to us from outside hospitals as failed dilation. And group B where patients that were referred to us from within our institute, say from the head and neck cancer group or from the thoracic surgery group. As you'll notice that the etiology of these strictures were various from 
pill injuries, radiation, corrosives, anastomotics, and so on. And we had a total of 56 patients, 20 in group A and 36 in group B. What we found that in over 50% of the patients who were referred to us as failed dilation from outside hospital and therefore refractory strictures, we could succeed in dilating them. And amongst these 55% of patients, around five out of the 11 patients required additional interventions like stenting, needle knifing, and so on. The other group where patients were referred to us directly up front without any previous attempts at dilation, the success rate in achieving dysphagia-free status was much more than group air, around 83% with a significant p-value. Over here also, five out of the 30 patients, that is around 16%, required additional interventions to achieve this success compared to 45% in the other group. And although this did not achieve a significant p-value, the trend was that if these patients are sent to us early on and we use our MCW protocol, there's a higher chance that we will succeed and prevent them from going into refractory states. This is all good news, but real life is very different. Let me show you this case, 55-year-old man, supraglottic squamous cell cancer, completed radiotherapy, now developed significant aspiration that led to total laryngectomy, followed by a tight hypopharyngeal esophageal strictures. He was dilated every three to four weeks for two years, failed. Following this, we started dilating him every week, did not work, he became G-tube dependent, and therefore, now what do we do? We taught this patient to self-dilate. How do we teach them is a different topic that I can discuss some other day. We have now 11 such patients who are doing extremely well, and we are soon going to write it up for publication. We have now formally started a self-dilation clinic. Hello, good morning, how are you doing? I'm doing just fine. And thank you for giving us permission to record you. You're welcome. have you been dilating yourself? About three years. And you dilate uh, how many times a day? Four times a day. And what dilator size do you use? I use a 36 and a 38. The concept of self-dilation is not new and even predates many of the fancy stuff that we are doing nowadays. The first case was described in 1961, followed by another three cases the same year. And in 1984, 13 patients with a total of 4,600 home dilations were described. Recently, 16 patients did self-dilation up to a maximum of a 60 French or 20 millimeter diameter. And interestingly, in none of these cases, any perforation was reported. So despite all the endoscopic techniques that are described, we will still have around a quarter of these patients who will fail, not counting the patients whom we teach them to do self-dilation. So if they fail and do not want to go for self-dilation, what next? So here is a new strategy that is being looked at by our colleagues from Regenerative Medicine. Whenever we apply endotherapy, such as when we dilate, there is mucosal shearing effect that compromises the epithelial barrier of the region. When the stent is pulled out, the whole epithelial barrier is compromised, as you see over here, and similar damage to the epithelium happens when we use electrocautery. The natural healing process of this leads to restructuring. 
As a result of this, whenever we apply endotherapy such as dilation, we break the mucosal barrier, the mucosal barrier causes fibrosis and we keep going in circles. So besides focusing on endotherapy in this part of the equation, now we are beginning to focus on this region of mucosal damage. To understand this a little bit more, let's look at what happens when there is mucosal injury. Fibrosis sets in in two weeks while centripetal growth of the epithelium takes around about five weeks. So by the time the epithelium grows back and the fibrosis has already set in, you have got luminal distortion. As you'll see over here, the epithelial barrier is still broken. There is still inflammation, but fibrosis has already set in. And by five weeks after we remove the offending agent, the epithelium grows back, but the lumen is already distorted. So there are two approaches to address this. One is to delay the fibrosis and make it go beyond two weeks and let's make it go to eight weeks so that the epithelium can compete with it. Or we can hasten the epithelization and make it come first rather than fibrosis coming first. So one strategy to delay fibrosis is to inject steroids into the stricture after dilation or even give the patient oral steroids. There are a lot of studies published out there and some beautiful elegant studies have also come from Rakesh Kocher from Chandigarh, uh, looking at the periodic dilatation index and the results have been pretty mixed. As you will see, the recurrence rate with steroids was significantly less compared to those who did not get steroids in this meta-analysis of around about 270 patients. And then there's another study looking at 27 articles where they have found that the mean number of dilations was less in the steroid group compared to the other group. So it is worth a try. And therefore, in our cases, when we dilate them, we do inject steroids. I deliberately didn't talk about it in my talk earlier on because I was going to bring it up here, but we do not give oral steroids. In a similar approach, people have used mitomycin C, which suppresses fibroblast proliferation and collagen synthesis. And this is done by putting an overtube through the scope, you pass a forceps, you catch a small piece of a paper into which you soak the mitomycin C at the dose of 0.4 milligram per ml and you apply it locally to the site. And in many studies, this has also been shown to be effective in reducing the recurrence of stricture, but most of the studies are in the pediatric population. My suggestion is that if you want to try these, these are pretty harmless approaches, steroids or mitomycin C, give it a shot but you'll still land up with a fair number of patients where nothing is working. What about strategy two, hastening epithelization before fibrosis sets in? In this study done on eight dogs, autologous adipose tissue derived stromal stem cells were suspended in phosphate buffer saline and immediately injected at the site of endoscopic submucosal dissection as shown over here. And what they found is that by this approach, they could significantly reduce stricture formation compared to the control group where no such material was injected at the site of circumferential ESD. These authors went one step ahead. Rather than wait for autologous pluripotent cells injected to the site of ESD to grow into an epithelium, they took autologous skin epithelium or oral buccal mucosal keratinocytes and grew them into cell sheets two weeks before endoscopic submucosal dissection. And at that time of dissection, they directly applied these epithelial cell sheets to the raw surface so that we can have instant epithelial barrier restored and thereby reduce the stricture formation as was shown in three pigs that were treated 
compared to three pigs that were not treated. There are many, many more animal studies validating these results that I don't have time to get into, but basically how good are animal studies when applied to humans. So the first study that used the cell sheet tissue engineering technique in humans came out from Japan. It was an open label non-randomized study on nine patients with superficial esophageal cancer who underwent circumferential EST involving a minimum of two thirds of the circumference. Cell sheets were cultured around two weeks prior to the ESD and then they were applied to the raw surface on the day of the ESD. You don't have to apply it covering the whole area. You can apply it in patches and they will interconnect with each other within a week. What they found is that re occurred in about 3.5 weeks as far as the entire mucosa is concerned and only one of the nine patients developed a stricture. One may argue what good is a technique that is not readily available, expertise driven, and I cannot apply it in my practice. So being aware of this problem, a study was conducted where a center was identified which was over 1,200 kilometers away autologous pluripotent cells were harvested from the patient with courier sent to that center. They grew it into cell sheets and couriered it back. And after they came back, the patients underwent ESD and successful engrafting was shown in all. So this is a technique that can be applied if you recognize centers in your country who can do it for you and courier it back to you. Others have used synthetic collagen material instead of cell sheets, and others have also used commercially available extracellular matrix, including donated human skin like alloderm. Another human study where in patients with Barrett's esophagus or squamous cell cancer, since they have multiple metachronous lesions, this group from Pittsburgh stripped the entire human esophageal epithelium out using a varicose vein stripping device as shown over here. Invariably, these patients will develop long strictures. So they immediately placed a stent covered with porcine extracellular matrix and found that none of these patients developed stricture. The stents were removed after two weeks. This study was presented by the president of the Chinese Society of Digestive Endoscopy in the ASGE CSDE session that I was chairing using autologous skin grafting surgery to prevent esophageal stricture after circumferential endoscopic dissection in humans. So basically they did split thickness skin grafting, covered the graft, on a stent, placed it across the area where they had done circumferential ESD, and six months later found that there is skin growing in the esophagus and in the patients who only got the stent without the skin graft wrapped around it, there was around 78% developing complex strictures, while it was only 36% in those with the graft with a significant p-value. Although not ready for prime time, there are many studies going on on how to regrow the esophagus using principles of regenerative medicine. One such human case has already been reported. This is very preliminary, but stay tuned. So in summary, we follow the aggressive dilation protocol for our patients with refractory benign esophageal strictures where we dilate them in a step up manner once every week with steroid injections until we reach a target luminal diameter. Although we like to take the patient up to 16, 18 millimeters in luminal diameter, there may be cases where smaller diameters 
are good enough to maintain some quality of life. Once we reach the target luminal diameter, at each weekly dilation, we evaluate the extent to which the lumen has regressed compared to the previous dilation level we took the patient up to. Based on that, we decide the frequency of follow-up dilations, which can be increased from weekly to once every two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and so on. Or during this process, if the stricture comes back, we can revert back to frequent dilations. Success we defined as none to a maximum of one dilation every three months. If unsuccessful, we use additional measures such as electrocautery needle knife incision for short fibrotic or elastic strictures or expandable fully covered metal stents that can be removed for long strictures or a combination of both. It is very important that after we use additional measures, we immediately go back to weekly dilation to maintain the gains we have made with these additional measures and then follow the same protocol until we achieve success. For those patients where we are unsuccessful, we offer them the self-dilation approach and many of our patients may prefer to have the self-dilation approach before we apply additional measures like expandable esophageal stents. There are very limited amount of studies out there in the literature that have done head-to-head -head comparison of various techniques that everybody have been using. Therefore, no firm recommendations can be made at the current time. It is more of an art rather than a science. One thing, however, I would like to emphasize that all of this should be done in a multidisciplinary approach because at some point or the other, you may land up with a complication and you may require, say, your CT surgeons to help you out. Stay tuned for new strategies coming out to immediately repair the mucosal damage done by endotherapy so that not only can we dilate strictures with endotherapy, we can also prevent their recurrence. These techniques are using principles of regenerative medicine and are not yet ready for prime time. Again, want to thank Saurabh Mukhevar for having given me this opportunity and I want to thank all the panelists. I'm open to questions. Okay, great. Hi, Dr. Dua. Thank you so much. Hey. That was a fantastic talk. Yes, that was wonderful. Exciting to see the new regenerative medicine data, uh, hopefully ready for prime time. Esophageal strictures as uh, can be really a nightmare uh, to manage. And uh, we have a, a fairly difficult case, which we are going to discuss today. I know there are questions from the audience and uh, what we'll do is with the help of the case, at least it'll answer some of the common questions that will be uh, put in the chat box. And then the other questions we'll address at the end of the case. So uh, we have Dr. Ravi Daswani, who's a consultant gastroenterologist with us at Midas. And thank you, Ravi, for joining in. He'll be presenting the case. I'll be asking the questions to all the panelists and Dr. Dua as well. Uh, this uh, is a case from 2016. So um, we have my father, Dr. Shikan Mukhya, who's here as well, who's been actively involved in managing the case. He can give you more pointers about some clinical decisions that were made and if there are questions. Uh, we'll just help present the case and showcase exactly what was done. Okay, Ravi, over to you. Thank you. Um, at the outset, I would thank uh, Dr. Mukhevar sir for giving me this opportunity to present this very difficult case which he had managed successfully. So, um, this patient had presented in 2016 uh, with complaints of difficulty in swallowing and burning in chest. He, he gave history of consumption of toilet cleaner, which is a corrosive, six days prior to presentation. Uh, on the first endoscopy done at 72 hours, the picture was seen as in the video, which is uh, shown. There were multiple deep ulcers, uh, which were uh, with, which were covered with slough and which were almost uh, involving the entire circumference. And we classified this to be a Zerga 2B classification in the uh, endoscopic uh, classification of corrosive strictures. Uh, to decide regarding the feeding, we the patient underwent laparoscopic feeding jejunostomy on day eight. Uh, for continuation of his enteral feeding. 
Four weeks later, we re-scoped the patient and we found that there was a tight stricture uh, at just at the post cricoid area. The feeding jejunostomy feeds were continued. Patient was managed clinically. Okay. So uh, just to ask everyone in the audience, uh, well, uh, in the panelists, what is the most common type of stricture that you see in your clinical practice? In um, Dr. Bape, you see, you're also another part of Maharashtra. Yes, sir. I think uh, the commonest ones are the corrosives. I think uh, they still form the major bulk, followed by peptic and anastomotic, I think, in equal numbers. So I think uh, that kind of sums it up. But I think about 40 to 50 percent of our strictures are corrosive. Okay. Dr. Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. Philip, Matthew. Yeah. Uh, Saurabh, at the outset, I would like to congratulate you for this wonderful uh, uh, webinar. I Thanks. see a lot of enthusiasm in western part of India attending over 400. I must congratulate. <laughs> I enjoyed uh, listening to uh, my friend, Dr. Kulvinder Duva. I mean, audible there? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And down south, we, our unit is connected to the... I, I salute to your dad, Dr. Srikant. <laughs> and um, coming to your question about the type of strictures, I uh, ours is are not attached to the cancer center. We see a lot of post RT stricture, mm -hmm. radiotherapy induced stricture. Beginning of my career, I used to see a lot of corrosive stricture. But fortunately, it is coming down now with a better uh, awareness. I think they choose other modalities of uh, committing uh, whatever you call it. And mm -hmm. the second is the malignancy itself coming as a stricture. The third one will be, I will put it like the um, ischemic or I mean the anastomotic stricture. So my order will be post RT, which is most difficult to dilate. Second will be the malignancy, advanced malignancy. Third one operated for the malignancy or some benign causes. Anastomotic stricture. We okay. less often nowadays seeing corrosive stricture. This is, will be my answer in my uh, work clinical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, Sabrina, I see more of uh, malignant strictures than benign strictures. And uh, mm -hmm. out of the benign strictures, you know, uh, the number of corrosive stitches are drastically come down when compared to my past uh, experience. And uh, but you know, when it depends upon where you practice also. Suppose you are in a a public hospital like a government a teaching hospital and you see likely to see more of corrosive stricture but i see more of peptic stricture and anastomotic stricture and also radiation stricture and yeah. uh, sometimes because of the original aggressive on esd we see post esd stitches as well okay. and um, I, I think uh, corrosive strictures i do uh, uh, see less often now but i, I think the most difficult one to uh, manage is a corrosive stricture yeah no, I agree. I think we, we also looked at our data. We had about um, 75 patients in the last two years. It was a lower, um, lesser busy years with COVID. But it, interestingly, we thought we saw a lot of corrosive strictures, but we saw more peptic. I think probably because uh, the corrosives are the ones who come back again and again. So you think that you're seeing more of that. But actually, in terms of uh, absolute numbers, we saw probably more peptic just because um, they probably got one or two dilations that are done. Corrosives are actually just came every week. So that's probably why. All right. And just another question. Now, in this particular case, what you saw was really deep ulcers. And uh, any, in terms of your management, uh, do, you, do any of you use steroids or so antibiotics up front before they come back later with, uh, with uh, bad strictures? Up front, like earlier phase? I, I think, you know, I, yes. Can so you? I would have placed a rice tube. Yeah. The minimum guaranteed lumen will be available. Right. Okay. So, uh, Sometimes what I've seen is almost like a pinhole. Uh, right. You're right. not even able to pass a guide. Well, I had a case where even the uh, pinhole also could not be identified. We had to inject the contrast with the force. Sometimes what I used to do is uh, using the ERCP cannula of the guide where injecting the contrast what I used to call them as universal guidance, under the fluoroscopy, under cannula guidance, under guideware guidance, and contrast guidance, so there is great difficulty to identify the lumen. 
but right. provide such uh, scenarios in your case i don't know whether you have done the rail strip right from beginning you keep it there you want it's a great little discomfort for the patient but when you come back after a few weeks it'll be great to uh, see that he the lumen is there yeah no that's a good point it's a good point yeah i think uh, we have, we do have a fairly long case because it is just a long case so we'll just keep going so and we we'll continue with questions so in terms of uh, preferred mode of endoscopic management i think balloon versus boogie is, is a classic question i think in india we do tend to use boogie more in our series we use about 96% of boogie at our hospital uh, but uh, any any preference in, in a, like dr duard did mention in the longest pictures boogies are preferable as as correctly pointed out but uh, anybody has a different thought dr choudhury is here hi how are you thank you uh, can i make a comment Yes, yes, sir. Please, please. There are two things which are very important. Uh, when your surgeon does a feeding jejunostomy, you must always tell him to have a look at the stomach. What right. happens is that if you have a combined injury, you will never be able to assess a gastric injury because your dye doesn't reach the stomach. So right. a lot of mistakes are made. So always the surgeon must always look at the stomach. And yes. second, surgeons have a tendency to do gastrostomy. Always avoid a gastrostomy because for feeding the genostomy is better because you're going to use that stomach as a conduit for subsequent surgery just a right. two points over there no thank you that's yeah. that's a great uh, point we'll see that in can the i can now. i make a comment <laughs> yes. hello yes yeah actually uh, when um, you, these corrosives ones they present to you uh, in the earlier week it's a long time that you cannot start a dilation and nutrition is a major problem so we made it a protocol that they should undergo some sort of feeding procedure and it is preferably feeding jejunostomy as again feeding gastrostomy because many of them they have the uh, injury to the stomach uh, which is quite uh, it's not possible to do uh, jejunost uh, gastrostomy also uh, gastro jejunostomy there so we prefer to have a feeding jejunostomy putting in a rails tube uh, makes you uncomfortable and um, the feeding is also not to that extent because many of these patients they have gastric outlet obstruction so i am not in favor of uh, doing the rails tube uh, business right in these patients because they have simultaneous esophageal alveolar stomach injury and pyloric uh, narrowing So, Shrikant, uh, Bhabha, if you, yes. uh, I have um, I have a case uh, at the VA hospital who keeps doing this again and again, uh, some psych issue. But anyway, the problem with that patient is that there's an extreme degree of stenosis of the pyloroantral region and the D1 of the duodenum, and our debate is that should we keep dilating this guy to keep the esophageal passage open and risk perforation one of these days when if we keep the esophagus open nothing is going to empty from the stomach and therefore we wanted our surgeons to commit whether they will do a gastro jejunostomy down the road if they say no then is there a point in dilating them because this guy we have been dilating him and every day he is regurgitating so much of his gastric contents out to the extent that we have to put a nasogastric decompression tube in this man yeah so, so so looking yeah looking at the downstream passage is also important while you're deciding on what to do with the yeah. esophagus dr dua you made a brilliant point because if you do not assess your stomach and you keep working on the esophagus it's a waste so the outlet has to be there so i absolutely yeah. agree with you and this is a mistake we often make yeah so, yeah If between the two things first thing to be tackled is the gastric injury first if a patient has a combined injury mm. no just yeah, and you, even even if you have gastric outlet obstruction and one day you decide to put a stent across the esophageal stricter it won't work it won't, it won't work will have problems patient, patient yeah. will have so much of reflux coming up the stent into his mouth with the gastric outlet obstruction yeah, yeah. no great So, uh, just in terms of the choice of dilation, uh, Dr. Amol Bape, you did raise your hand. So, yeah. So, uh, I, I fully agree with uh, you know what Dr. Moodua uh, mentioned that 
for long strictures particularly corrosive strictures i think the bougie dilatation works uh, you know much better than balloons uh, balloons we would usually reserve for short strictures peptic strictures where uh, there's a just a ring stricture there the balloon works well i would also like to add one comment about uh, what tsc mentioned about the nasogastric tube or the rice tube and uh, dr adarsh objected to that now see the nasogastric tube is not pur the purpose is not for feeding it is to maintain the luminal patency of the esophagus in the early early days and for that purpose especially when we are seeing a severe injury to the esophagus after an an endoscopy has been done in the first 48 to 72 hours it is a good idea to retain that nasogastric tube for about 4 to 6 weeks until the patient comes back for a formal evaluation as to how the stricture can be treated in future right that's that's our uh, my thought process yeah thank you i think the points were taken there's also comment from venkat krishnan leela krishnan we can pass probably a nasogastric tube during the first endoscopy probably to serve either to keep the lumen patent perhaps with jejunum access then you can feed as well so mm -hmm. perhaps something that can be considered okay so uh, ravi uh, yeah 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 mathi here mathi here i all, i always uh, try to put a naso jejunal tube uh, uh, especially if the stomach is involved in the first insertion so, so when i yeah. do an endoscopy for uh, bad esophagus uh, where i think the patient does not require surgery immediately then yeah. i would prefer to put uh, naso jejunal but for children I put, uh, generally tend to do a feeding jejunostomy rather than a nasogastric tube because children will not tolerate that tube for long. Okay, no, interesting. Hello, right. about Ravi. balloon and buji, I have a, yeah, yeah. how to see the case and decide it. I have had a patient of micro stomach, mm -hmm. and if mm -hmm. you dilate with the because of the corrosive, mm -hmm. and if you dilate with the uh, buji, what happens? Sometimes the stomach get uh, may damage or even perforation can happen so mm -hmm. the stomach has to be adequate to follow the dilatation because beyond the g junction you are carrying the the buji and mm -hmm. what i have done a different technique is in the balloon also you can do a nice long dilate i mean uh, stricture also can be dilated first we will take the balloon to the stomach side mm -hmm. then pull it start dilating from the g junction and come up to the If you do the reverse, start from uh, uh, more uh, proximally, and the wings will form in the balloon. So very difficult to dilate it. So uh, I will choose it depending on the size of the stomach, balloon or a buji. With a balloon also, you can effectively dilate it. Start from G junction to proximal. Okay. Okay. Also, also one one thing I, I want. Would... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. I just want to make a comment on what. Uh... Tc had told. See, when you do like that, by mistake, if you make a perforation below and you cannot mm -hmm. actually go back with your scope, it becomes a problem. But mm -hmm. I, what I suggest or what I practice is short stretches balloon and long mm -hmm. stretches complicated mm -hmm. one. And what I use uh, buji. And yeah. I agree that uh, what Tc told is you now with experience actually uh, you can actually choose whatever it is because the results are almost same uh, yeah. with uh, balloon or with uh, right. buji. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, one one point I would like to bring up also is that uh, when we started using the large diameter balloons, uh, you know, like CRE balloons for dilating the ampullary opening to pull out large bile duct stones, mm -hmm. I always use contrast, and I see how the waste of the balloon disappears while we are inflating the balloon. And what we realized is that whatever the PSI pressure. says like okay if you are at three atmosphere your balloon diameter is 15 it never goes to 15 in tight strictures so if you are not using fluoro and you are assuming that you inflated the balloon to say 3 psi and you are at 15 mm diameter you will be surprised when you use fluoro with dilute contrast that your balloon never went up to 15 and there is a very tight waste in the balloon that is different for buji if you put a 45 french buji which is 15 mm and you take it across your guaranteed you stretched it to 15 so we are doing a study right now where we are looking at the balloon waste despite the psi telling us one finding or one reading whether the waste fully expanded or not and whether there was also 
um, you know, uh, full dilation of the balloon or partial dilation of the balloon. So, so keep that in mind that with balloon, you can be misled by calling it as you inflate it to 12 millimeters with just looking at the atmosphere. And you may be wrong if you did not have concomitant fluoro. And many of us don't use fluoro. So we are currently running, my fourth year fellow is running a study to see mm -hmm. how those atmospheres compared to the waste of the balloon in tight structures while using fluoro. Okay. Dr. Du, I'll put it the other way. We never do it uh, without fluoroscopy. Yeah. Personal... That's great. That is, that is, uh, yeah, that is great. Uh, uh, I think a... that is, that is the way you should do it. Yeah. yeah. The waste is not relative. We're more careful and uh, we will not proceed further and we'll wait for that. Suppose to be forcibly dilated with the uh, Buji and in such a situation, there can be a chance of perforation. No, yeah, you are right. But Buji has the advantage that you can palpate the stricture. See, the, with the uh -huh. balloon, you're using a yeah, pump. Yeah. With a Buji, you have a feel of resistance, what I call as palpating the stricture. And uh, that is what will determine how much force you can use and whether you should go to the next level or not. Okay. Dr. Dua, I think it is absolutely right. You know, use how tight it is. And I think, you know, that is quite temporary. And I, I feel that while using balloon, always, always use fluoro and I use contrast also inside the balloon. So that will give a very good idea of Milwaukee, do not, do not use fluoro, which is concerning. Yeah. Okay. I think we always uh, we always use fluoro for yeah. our uh, patients, all the patients, and we have maximum experience with bujis. Only one point which I would like to tell that when you start dilating these patients right from the lower dilator, it should cross the G junction. So that, you know, it should not happen that the lower dilators have not crossed and subsequently the large diameter um, dilator has crossed. That can inadvertently cause a perforation. So mm -hmm. it's always better that uh, the entire bujis crosses the from upper end to the lower end, especially the G junction. That practice should be done. Okay. All right. Just, we'll just move forward uh, with the case because it's a long case. And there are a lot of questions. So anyway, I think Lovey, we can move forward with the data. Bottom line, I think randomized controlled trials have shown more difference between Bougie versus Balloon. Uh, slightly more pain with Bougie, but that's just about it. Next. Okay, so what diameter would you start the Bougie dilation with? So, can you take us for that? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can tell you that, that, you know, yeah. all Bougies have got a taper tip. Yeah. If you, I mean, the ones that we use over here, uh, they have, uh, you know, blue markings that is from the tip onwards and red markings that is from the site of the maximum diameter of the bougie upwards. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful which of the two you are looking at. Uh, so, but the point is that every bougie has got a taper tip. So mm -hmm. if you overcall and take a large bougie, your feel of the resistance will stop you. If you take, if you undercall and you take a thin bougie, you will go through it very easily, and you can gauge what you should start off with after that. So it's kind of a guesstimate. You can guess, start off with one value. The tip mm -hmm. will go through. It is very thin, and then based on the resistance, you decide to proceed or not to proceed and go down or go up. Okay. All right. Next. So in one session, there's always this rule of three, can go up to three millimeters from the initial one. Uh, I guess it's still not applicable for people with experience. So what would be the maximum diameter you're comfortable with? Say you started with, you know, I don't know, four mm. uh, The rule of three, we would, uh, we would kind of uh, have that in mind. 
Only thing is the rule of three does not start with uh, the first bougie that you use, but the no, it starts exactly. with the one which where wherein you encounter your first resistance. So suppose right. you start with the seven and that walks through very easily, mm-hmm. and then your nine nine is the one which you get your first resistance. Then it's starting from nine, then you'll go up to eleven and twelve point eight. Then I w- I would be reluctant to go up to fourteen at in that session. I'll reserve that probably for the next session. And uh, you know that is usually how we use it. So it may actually amount to four or five dilations, depending on the guesstimate, as Dr. Dua rightly said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. My working rule will be: I just assess endoscopically the stenotic site. Yeah. Not going to admit. Then I decide below twelve and three consecutive one. The mm-hmm. moment you are feeling resistance, the moment you see the alteration in the pulse rate. <laughs> Yeah. so that give you a guidance that what okay, we should not proceed beyond that pulse rate so, of the patient so patient or the doctor <laughs> <laughs> well, i think both are important so uh, now so, can i make a comment yes, please, please. what what i do is you know when i use a conventional uh, uh, size endoscope or adult endoscope uh, not at the rapid you know i'm only conventional endoscope but it doesn't go i always use a pediatric endoscope and see whether that's going yeah and yeah. then 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 i start uh, depending upon us uh, tsc has told depending upon the judgment on endoscopy i use a lesser size of the endoscope to start with if it is not going mm-hmm. and if it is very easy then i use a next one and uh, as amola has told once it has come to a resistance then i use the rule of 3 and i want rule of 3 i want to actually go beyond a particular uh, uh, size or difficult size in the first session itself and after dilatation i tend to uh, use the endoscope and see what is the extent and what damage it has created okay. and uh, uh, we will discuss about the steroid injection later because you know many times i started the first session itself let's go yes, we do have that so yeah, just on, on that not lines do you rescope in between to determine mucosal appearance i i have a tendency myself to do it all the time is, is that a time. common practice or yeah i i do it every time every time yes yeah okay i would uh, advise if you have a angulated suture very right. tight better not to rescope the reason is whatever micro perforation you would have even thought not of seen may get aggravated unless you are using carbon dioxide somebody you know tsc this uh, whether you use the between dilations i think between dilatation not through during the dilatation it is actually between dilatation not immediately uh, passing the guide wire Yeah. After you say did one savory, two savory, and then you go and see, no, make sure no, how no. bad it is. No, 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 no. Next, don't do that. No, no. Of, that I don't do. No. I, I don't do. I'll, I don't also do. don't know. I right. understood that no. Every every session before no after the doing oh, one. Oh no, no no. This is this is while I'm doing the savories. I you, no no no. I don't, I don't do that. Just quickly take a look and see how bad it is. Then we'll dilate. Three, three, three. Uh, you know, one, two, three, and then yeah. we we'll scope again before moving the patient out of the room. Right. And if there is any, if there is any suspicion of perforation, I inject some contrast also and see water soluble right. contrast in the lumen and see whether there is a real perforation mm-hmm. or not. A, I will not do every gate where passage, every size uh, after every size. Oh. I will not. Fair enough. That's that's that cumbersome. Contrast. Now I want to tell you a point here. Yeah, I agree. Contrast and yeah. fluoroscopy very difficult to pick up. The unless you have a macro perforation, which you are solving. Agree. Agree. The best yeah. if you have a suspicion about a micro perforation, CT is a better choice than ordinary fluoroscopy. And you have to move move the patient 360 degree and put the contrast. Very difficult to find out the leak. that will mislead you also and false sense of security will give that there is no perforation if yeah. you are doubting perforation ct scan is the answer and right. we are passing the contrast to check the uh, leak is just to satisfy yourself and not to identify the perforation because very difficult to under fluoroscopy okay. one important clinical sign which i would like to stress upon sir of all mm-hmm. patients who undergo dilation even if they are in a, in a day care procedure they should be held in the recovery for about 4 hours at least yeah. and check their pulse rate should be checked as well as back pain if the patient mm-hmm. develops severe back pain post dilatation or if there is rising tachycardia 
mm-hmm. i think these are the patients who need some kind of, of a, uh, contrast evaluation either a contrast swallow or a ct scan because you know there's a fair chance that we'll find a perforation micro macro whatever right, right. Uh, amol i i always palpate the neck also before i yeah. send the patient Agreed. always palpate for surgical mcm definitely okay so any any change in change in the style uh, of your of your approach based on etiology of stricture i guess it's a broad question but uh, you guys did answer allude to the fact that the roses and the radiation ones are worse but uh, uh, in terms of your aggressiveness are you do you are you dif- less aggressive with certain strictures versus others uh, for example in a patient with uh, peptic stricture it's a short stricture many times and i use a balloon uh, uh, dilatation most of the time and right. uh, corrosive stricture uh, i i use uh, more of uh, sabregular or bougie dilator yeah and uh, etiology wise i think you know the toughest stricture uh, strictures are corrosive strictures and yeah. radiation strictures are very gentle and i wish be very careful because you not know, very likely to perforate or easily perforate so i be very gentle and my dilatations actually uh, i may not go even up to the uh, 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 rule of 3 also i may stop in between and uh, i'd be very very careful about uh, that radiation strictures Because we recognize that eosinophilic esophagitis strictures are very, um, they're, they're more prone to perforation. So I, yes, I guess exactly. in such cases, not not very commonly seen. That's a uh, experience. Not, is not, not very yeah. lucky that we don't have eosinophilic that much here as you see in USA. My yeah. style of working would be would be extraordinarily cautious while dilating the corrosive stricture, particularly yeah. in the early stage. Number one. Mm-hmm. i would like to always like to know the stomach size before using the buji and right. the most difficult stricture to dilate is the radiotherapy post radiotherapy right. right very difficult sometimes even the while passing the buji itself the patient moves actually yeah uh-huh. very difficult and you have to be aware of that uh, that uh, more difficult to treat and sometimes malignant strictures can perforate you have to be very careful and yeah. another word of caution is If you have the whole use of it is uh, replaced by a colon and the antrum, they have kept the, all the multiple anastomotic size. You have to be extraordinary cautious. What is the anatomy? So you must refer to the surgical notes. They were anastomos to the stomach, antrum. Then it is going to the uh, jejun. I had a case where they had anastomos multiple organs for some reason or other. The old technology, I don't know what is it. So I have to be very careful. Uh, in dilating such a stricture yeah yeah thank you no exact malignant we would not want to dilate all right next uh, any uh, pediatric patients uh, i know dr matthew philip you mentioned and you you do see some pediatric patients a- any special precautions that you would take so pediatric side the most of the strictures what we see is actually anastomotic stricture post uh, uh, to repair these are the common strictures uh, they come to us and yeah. uh, uh, we always uh, see the stricture and many times you know either we can use uh, i have even used a biliary balloon for these patients but uh, most of the time we use buji and mm-hmm. it succeeded the problem comes in you know, recently i had a patient uh, uh, i observed dr duva has shown something similar that they had a patient an adult patient and a pediatric patient adult patient post radiation i mean uh, first laryngectomy stricture where there was a gap between the esophagus and the proximal and distal esophagus where we mm-hmm. used uh, this technique and uh, uh, yeah. we actually put test and uh, not poetry but uh, something similar to that uh, we made a blind yeah. puncture and puncture and then dilated in a child i have now and i have not done that because you no know, uh, mm-hmm. in that case in a child i may have to use a lamps you know so i have to use a bilary lamps uh, for mm-hmm. or a small size lamps for that so actually i want to get a little more exp- opinion from uh, professor duva to use uh, lamps in this type of uh, stricture which are actually totally uh, blocked and we can uh, dilate using it i mean after dilatation we can put a lamp so i would after i mean sometime we can uh, discuss on that and children the only thing is that uh, uh, this anastomotic stricture sometimes very resistant and we try to put a tube after dilatation to see that and perforations are also more likely because we are adults we use adult techniques to handle children And, and what would be a goal sort of diameter in these patients adults fine 15 <laughs> or target uh, adult uh, children what i achieve try to achieve is actually the scope going beyond that and uh, uh, that is what we usually do we, as, we mm-hmm. use a pediatric scope and uh, yeah. uh, so i usually use a clinical judgment about the child whether the child is able to swallow that is the most common 
judgment we use for in children other than in adults there right. may be criteria but uh, uh, i am not sure about that in adult we know that we have a fixed idea that how much we should add it but in children i am not sure how much we should go about but i always go for a clinical judgment if the child says the i mean the mother says the child is able to solo well there is no regurgitation and no losses then that's fine right. so the, just on the lines of the diameter of the scope there is a question i am also addressing some q and a Uh, if the endoscope can be passed through a stricture, should they be uh, should they offer dilation? This is by Dr. T. S. C. P. R. Atna, I believe from Sri Lanka. Uh, what's the outcome in this situation? So, if you you can pass the regular uh, standard upper endoscope across, should we keep dilating? I, I suppose yes, because the yes. goal is clean. But yeah, that should be done. Right? Mm-hmm. So, if, the, if the patient has symptoms, I think if the patient has symptoms, even if the scope goes, he it has to be dilated. right yeah i one, i think one one thing uh, that, yes yeah one thing yes. Uh, yeah one thing we should also realize is that uh, many of these patients despite the stricture also have lost their peristalsis so mm-hmm. the mor- the motility of the strictured area especially long strictures with radiation and uh, dr shakir one of our uh, motility experts uh, did a study on how is the motility pattern after radiation to that area or corrosive injury and it is amazing that the only way the food goes down in many of these patients is gravity mm-hmm. so they have to be upright and maybe soft liquid diet uh, and the food goes down because of poor peristalsis or zero peristalsis in the affected area so if a scope goes down it's like a funnel with a 9 mm diameter versus a funnel with a 12 mm diameter which will be better for the patient's swallowing that's why they come back with symptoms sometimes so so um, we we give those instructions i mean i i don't know whether you have uh, post dilation uh, discharge instructions uh, coming up as question answers but that is one of the things we always tell our patients right and, and you know we have a lot of experience in pediatric cases we reported in indian pediatric uh, journal also on most of our cases where post operative tracheoceval fistula surgery and the youngest uh, patient we have operated is i mean dilated is one month old baby and most of them are very short suture and the time i mean we have used only the cre balloon the advantage of cre balloon is you can see through the suture area and dilate it very carefully and our results are better if they report to us soon after the uh, surgery there is a stricture uh, later they report then the results are not that uh, i mean that good so uh, the idea is short stricture cre balloon you can see the see through effect of the how it is getting dilated and the early dilatation would be better okay thank you all right next uh, i think we can move forward with the case ravi let's just uh, keep mo- keep moving forward yeah the next dilation i think uh, is an important question dr dua did address to it it should be 7 days and uh, i think clinically it can be a challenge in india but um, uh, sometimes people are coming from far away uh, but 7 days seems to work better as dr dua pointed so out i just wanted to ask dr dua we uh, means experience of 7 days versus others did they have a control group where uh, they had uh, had a different uh, duration of dilation as compared to one week yeah good good question we had an inbuilt control in the paper that we have uh, coming up in gie and presented at dgw the the patients who were sent to us from outside hospital had a wide spectrum of frequency of dilations done by the referring doctor some of them every 4 weeks some of them every 8 weeks some of them so it was a wide spectrum but none of those patients had a weekly dilation protocol done so they were sent to us uh, like i can give you an example of one of my ex fellows who is practicing in town sent me a case who had uh, eight dilations done but they were spaced out like four weeks six weeks again four weeks and sometimes 12 weeks and well he's not responding that this phage is coming back so that same patient who came to us became his own control and we started that weekly dilation and 55% of them we could salvage with weekly dilation uh, there were five patients who required additional measures so when these patients are referred to us they are not referred to us for dilation because the 
referring doctor thinks that I have done the dilation, it's not working. They are being referred to us for electrocautery. They have been referred to us for stenting. And then to their surprise, we tell them, sorry, our dilatations worked. And now it is something that is picking up in town. So, so in, in that regard, I would say that compared to the control, we had about the patient being his own control, we had about a 55% success rate when we rolled them into weekly dilation. Yeah, oh, great. Okay, Ravi, you want to move forward with the case. Uh, let's move forward with this. We'll sort of leave it to that. Okay. Yeah. So in, on the seventh week, a uh, patient came for the first session of dilatation, which was planned and on the previous endoscopy. Uh, endoscopy was performed under CO2 insufflation. So we could see a very tight stricture and adult endoscope could not be negotiated beyond this stricture, uh, just below the uh, cricoid area. Can... So we passed a savory uh, spring tip guide wire and over the guide wire dilatation was performed. Uh, gradual dilatations in increasing with increment from 7 mm to 11 mm. Uh, unfortunately, post dilatation endoscopy revealed a significant amount of blood in the stomach as well as significant amount of fresh blood in the uh, esophagus as well. However, the patient was clinically stable. We admitted the patient and on the uh, uh, in this video, we cannot see any rent or any free air on the fluoroscopy. Uh, however, on the next day, the patient had respiratory distress. Uh, X-ray uh, of the chest revealed uh, left-sided pleural effusion. Uh, patient uh, received IV antibiotics, IV fluids, and was kept near the mouth. And uh, we also did a, a CT scan of the thorax and upper abdomen, which revealed a collection uh, uh, around that area, as well as pleural effusion and ICD was inserted. Okay. Gastrographin study revealed a leak from that area. Um, so this is uh, the, yeah. Yeah, so I think if, if, you go, if you go back to the video, I think I saw a perf. It, it briefly comes into the view. Um, e either way, now you have evidence of uh, perf. Don't have to waste time on that, but uh, there on the top, yeah. Right, right. Move yeah. forward. It's fine. Yeah. Well, just in our experience, I think we've had one perforation over the last two years, which is about 0.6%. Um, move forward. Ravi, next. Yeah. I, I think just to allude to the safety of uh, dilation, uh, based on this large experience of 1,500 dilations, it's about 0.5% per intervention. And next, next, yeah. So the most common is the malignant or the peptic strictures uh, alluded by this uh, audience, uh, by the panelists. Next. So the patient was uh, managed with IV antibiotics and conservatively, and he followed up after two weeks. Uh, a gasographin study was performed again, and it revealed a healed leak. Uh, we also performed a barium meal follow through. Uh, the barium uh, was retained in the stomach even after 17 hours of delay with no opacification of the small bowel suggestion of gastric outlet obstruction. And hence, we were now uh, faced with these problems. So, the the patient has a soft wheel stricture, has a perforation post dilation, which did heal uh, conservatively without requiring a stent or so. Uh, gastric outlet obstruction is evident with probably a pyloric stricture. What to, uh, to do next? When you took your endoscope back into the stomach, did you cross the duodenum? Did you see any gastric duodenal injuries? Uh, sir, in the uh, in the first endoscopy, which was done on day three of ingestion of caustic injury uh, caustic uh, substance, uh, we did see the duodenum and there were ulcers around that area, and there was significant amount of grade two injury, grade two C injury in the stomach as well. Uh, but in the last endoscopy where we did the dilatation, we did not see the pyloric area as well as the duodenum yeah. because of the blood, and uh, when we thought that we can monitor the patient and then follow him up. So you have to define gastric outlet obstruction. It's a very loose term. Is it antral, pyloric, long segment, duodenal? Is there a skip area in the jejunum? Uh, because much of the, you know, if it's a very short, say, antropyloric stricture, whether you can dilate that with a balloon versus a long complex stricture going down the duodenum versus whether the surgeons down the road can do a gastrojejunostomy if the rest of the 
small bowel looks fine. So I think you need a little bit more description and evaluation of what exactly is the nature of the outlet obstruction. Yeah. Okay. So then we can move forward. So this patient ended up getting a, yeah, go ahead, Ravi. We yeah, have Dr. Uh, Mike Wade here who was involved in managing this patient. Uh, hi, Dr. Mike Wade. He's a, a surgeon with Midas during this time. Uh, good evening. Can, Am I audible? I don't know what this done. Yeah. yeah, we can hear you. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. 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 Good evening, everybody. Uh, stomach was assessed. It was healthy, large stomach. And there was a stricture in the distal uh, entropyloric region. And uh, at posterior part of stomach and anterior part of stomach, both were normal. We decided to go ahead with uh, posterior retrochoric isoperistatic uh, loop gastrojejunostomy. And it was planned in much distal part. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, it was a loop gastrojejunostomy which was done. And, okay. Uh, it was Thank fine. Ravi, yeah. Can I make a comment here? Yes, Dr. Chaudhary, sorry. <clears throat> if we were doing this case, we would always ask our endoscopist how sure they are going to manage the esophageal stricture endoscopically. Because suppose now this esophageal stricture cannot be managed endoscopically. You have to do a second surgery now for the esophageal stricture. So we are very conservative in doing intervening in the gastric part first, because if we know that esophageal stricture cannot be managed in the same sitting, we can manage the esophageal stricture also, and the gastric injury also. So we possibly would have waited longer so that in one stage, do both things together. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Next. Others, others uh, be yeah. basically, yeah. you know, all these corrosives, they are very difficult to manage. But then, you know, considering both the surgeries together, like gastrojejunostomy or esophageal surgery, which becomes major surgery without giving a patient an option of dilatation. I think uh, in a, only after one no, sitting no. of esophageal I, I, dilatation. I, I never said that. I said I will wait longer to pronounce whether this patient is successful endoscopically or you feel that endoscopy has not worked. So subsequently, he might need surgery. So in one stage, you could have done two things. So mm -hmm. I'm not so saying that. Yeah. Ardash, Ardash, I have a question. Yeah. If the and if if it takes us several weeks to determine yeah, yeah. whether whether endotherapy is going to work or not, yeah, you are going to do a laparoscopic jejunal feeding yeah. tube placement, which is kind of like a, another That's minimally right. invasive surgery. That's right. So, That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So what I what I was saying was I think you guys over years have developed an understanding that this structure is not going to do well. You have that seventh sense. By doing a couple of times, you come to know that this patient might need multiple procedures. I'm not saying the rule of thumb. I mean, what I'm just going to stress is sometimes it's better to wait for a while so that you can do both surgeries in one go. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Sarob, I took the point is well taken, yeah. So, Adas and view, yeah. we have collaborated with Dr. Chandra Mogan, who had done a lot of work in corrosive. Yeah. The first step is assess how much esophageal injury how much the stomach and gastroduodenal injury. If you have both the injuries and you wait uh, longer, you will see after six weeks or a few months, the total scenario would change. If the more scarring there in the esophagus the stomach and one go, they will uh, take him for surgery. Suppose mm -hmm. esophagus is short stricture, can be dilated easily. They would not like to take a formidable surgery, but they will go for only the the gastroduodenal management along with the surgery. So my yeah. take is, instead of hurriedly going for the surgery, because carousy takes something six weeks to six months, a good thing is to wait for at least three months. And mm -hmm. after three months only, we'll be able to assess how much submucosal injury has happened. If the muscle also involved, he is not going to be benefited with the dilatation at all, unless it is very short. So you have to go for surgery. So longer means, at least it's not longer, it's adequate time you have to wait for three months. Yes, see, for once I agree with you. You're becoming better now with time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so first thing you always do. If I may just uh, add one more comment. Yes. You know, somehow patients who've got significant gastric outlet obstruction which requires a gastrojejunostomy, 
usually their esophageal structures are more amenable for endoscopic therapy i don't know whether there's any data to support this whether there is you know other this is panel this is your this things. is your sheer belief <laughs> i agree it, it may be my belief i don't deny that but then this is something that we do see quite often and i would say that one or two dilations is too early to make any decision about anything related to the esophagus this is and no, 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 no. a j tube is definitely not something that we would want the patient to feed on for 3 months or 6 months for about 4 to 6 weeks until we have nothing at hand that's okay but if you guys can do a gastrogenostomy you can jolly well go ahead, go in again and do a you know esophageal the, the, the problem a problem on male is not jolly well you go in again <laughs> second time is not jolly well it's very easy to say jolly well yeah, a corrosive patient who's been operated once you have to reoperate him it's a technically very demanding operation and let me tell you gastrogenostomy <laughs> is not a good operation even others would find it difficult to go for the second time <laughs> even for, even first time gastrogenostomy is happening in the retrocolic area and cervical reconstruction is going okay. to happen in let's the move further. Right. let's move okay. further let's we'll move forward let's move forward we'll have more yeah. comments down the road yes okay okay now the cervix is the carousis are taken with a dilution and the yeah. faster major print of the attack is in the stomach in the carousis taken without any dilatation taken slowly the esophagus cricopharynx will be affected so it all depends on how hesitant he has taken how he has mixed it also and so yeah. many factors why you have a only damage to the antrum alone sometime or entire uh, ga upper ga is affected yeah no agree okay ravi you want to go ahead 20 patient underwent multiple sessions of dilatation and among these sessions he underwent seven times we had injected steroids intralesionally we chose to inject triamcin alone in aliquots of 0.5 ml and uh, dose was 10 ml a uh, 10 mg per ml and uh, this is the video of the same patient post dilatation we injected triamcin alone uh, with visualization of small bleb after the injection okay all right next so just looking at steroid injections i think there are a lot of questions as well on that question do you want to dilate, dilate uh, inject before or after dilation after after yeah the most would we'll do after i suppose okay next so how much to inject do you guys follow your four injection protocol or it's sort of ad hoc depending on each case most Which often it's ad hoc i'm sorry here yeah. most often it is ad hoc what ad hoc. Uh, uh, ravi have described as 0.5 at multiple locations locations yeah okay uh saurya and many yeah. times when you inject actually if you inject to uh, inject on normal on normal may not go there you have seen many right. times it is reflexing back yeah. <clears throat> and also i think the total number of injection also depends upon the uh, length of the stricture also so it actually varies right. you know some days you may have to use uh, multiple uh, you have to use more than one vial and uh, the, the dilutions also will change sometimes if you dilate just double dilution you may not be able to inject the needle will not the the to be very tough injection in that case you will dilute a little more in the, uh, you inject more than one number at the same site but i think you know many times it reflects back and you can see it coming out through the other site other site of puncture also sometimes so it will be very careful yeah. about the total amount what is delivered into that is uh, much yeah. more yeah i think that's the challenge we all face i suppose it does it all leaks out so um Uh, and it, it, where do you inject it? You inject in the sort of normal mucosal area, or just at the base post dilation tear in the tear region? It's in the fibrotic bands in the tear. That's where you inject. The the bands which have been broken down there, those are the locations where we would inject because that's what go, was going to reconnect again, and that's what we're trying to prevent. Right. A delay at least. You can't prevent that. It's delay. Uh, you know. Me. You know. An interesting. Uh, thought that has come up uh, peter dragonoff uh, who does a lot of esd work has been trying topical steroids like send the patient home on oral budesonide not systemic steroids like mm -hmm. we do for colitis patients to see if that can uh, help a little bit uh, and it's taken kind of every day it covers the lining and whether that's going to help his results have not been great for 
post ESD prevention of stricture formation, but I was sort of wondering whether we should apply it for these kind of cases to see if topical steroids can be given to them as a prescription to take for, if not two yeah. weeks, at least one week after dilation. Right. I think there's some data on that as well. The I'd use in these patients. So. Okay. All right. How many sites? Yeah, I think multiple sites, depending on the length. Uh, I think we'll skip this part, Ravi, just let's move forward with it. Uh, I think that basically the data, there are a couple of studies after dilation. Uh, next, Ravi. Yeah. So the, the other thing which Dr. Duarte pointed out was mitomycin C. I, I haven't personally used it much, but uh, for all those who use it, do you use it with steroids or uh, sort of, uh, not with, but prefer it over steroids or those who don't respond to steroids, any, any preference? Yeah, mitomycin C is used exclusively by our pediatric colleagues. Okay. Uh, and, and um, you know, they are the ones who even taught me how to use it, you know, how to put an overtube. They don't, it, the, the pharmacy has to constitute it. You, it's a, it's a, it's a chemotherapy agent yes. uh, in some ways. Uh, so they constitute it and we just take a biopsy forceps through the scope, catch a small piece of tissue into which, uh, not tissue, into a paper that we soak it into and apply it in patches. So they, they do it. I don't have personal experience on, on it in adults. Okay. But if you look at the literature, they are excellent results. But as with any publications on any topic, the good ones get published, the bad ones we never publish. Yeah. So, so how many people have failed using it never gets published. Right, right, true. No, uh, Saurabh, I just want yes. to ask uh, Dr. Duva, this is uh, actually injected locally or is just a local application? Application. It's application. Yeah. You have to ca ca uh, catch it with the forceps and uh, dip it in the solution. The reason you use an overtube is that you don't want it to touch to any other areas while you're going down. So through the overtube, you take the scope to the site. You already have that caught on your forceps at the tip of your scope, and then you touch it to that site at 0.4 uh, ml uh, uh, concentration. I see. 0.4 okay. milligram per ml concentration. Yeah. Okay. And do you apply it just for like a minute, or just for a prolonged duration? No, you just keep. It's like a patch. It's like patch painting I mean, when you have a you know like you do patchwork. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it tends to diffuse. It tends okay. to diffuse. Um, uh, the problem with the. the the, one of the problems with steroid injections is that, you know, like when you inject tattoos for documenting, say, a large polyp, polyp for your surgeons, they will yeah. tell you that when they operated, how much of the tattoo was lying in the peritoneum. Your right. needle went through and through and you injected it. So what are you doing with your injections? Are you injecting through and through? Are you injecting into it? Are you injecting superficially? It is leaking out. Uh, that is the unknown part of steroid injections that the technique in terms of depth of injection is so variable that you may be injecting and you thought you injected, but it went out in the mediastinum or it came out in the lumen. Right. Uh, Professor Duva, I just want to make a comment on that. See, mitomycin, when you apply locally, you know, how sure you can, it's going to remain there. It may be washed off with saliva after some time or it may go into the distal portion of the intravase also. And regarding the uh, tattoo you are telling, you know, now we use... Uh, uh, actually, we create a blub, mucos, submucosal uh, blub, and into that we actually inject. Uh, yeah, that, that, that you are so, you are absolutely right, now, but you but you cannot uh, make a blub in the esophagus with corrosive yeah, injury. No, that I agree. That I agree. Esophagus, yeah. you know, actually when you inject uh, uh, steroids, it's locally acting on even that is going into the muscle or maybe beneficial because here actually because of the corrosive structure, everything is gone. The whole area is a big fibrotic area. So actually, yeah. it will help uh, by injecting into the ice. But I am not sure mitomycin how it is going to remain there. It's maybe washed off yeah. down. Um, there are many questions. It's, a, it's, it's issue whether when you apply it, whether it gets deeper into the tissue uh, before the endoscopy is over at the spot. So, I mean, I, as I said, don't have experience with it. We don't use it much in the adults, but our pediatric people are using it a lot. And some of our pediatric patients, um, uh, just as an FYI, we have used uh, fully covered expandable biliary stents whenever we need to stent them, especially with uh, these atresia patients who are so small, they are in the first year of their life. Uh, we have even an eight millimeter biliary fully covered stent that you can use in them. 
The only problem I've faced is that the, at the end of the fully covered biliary stent, the wires are bare and mm. tissue grows into it, but it can easily be ripped out if you have to. Uh, and now, now we are getting our, what we are doing now, we have started a study where the resected, discarded esophagus at the time of atresia surgery, we are culturing the myocytes, the muscles and the epithelial cells on tissue matrices and grow them into autologous cell sheets on uh, porcine tissue matrix so that if this patient with atresia down the road requires a resection, we can use the autologous uh, tissue for tissue generation on a pure FDA cleared RB protocol for okay. re regeneration in, in children. In adults, we have, uh, after that one case we had in a 24 year old guy where we regrew the esophagus. In adults post esophagectomy for esophageal cancer, we are not doing these studies as yet because these patients have had radiation. They may get adjuvant chemotherapy and we don't know how tissue regeneration will happen in the background of chemo. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are now applying it only in the pediatric population based on RB FDA approved protocol. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Dora, for that. Yeah. Ravi, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. So, okay. So, this patient has 14 dilations, had recurrent symptoms. Basically, a young male, complex corrosive structure, long structure, difficult to dilate. Once perforated, repeat dilations with persistent symptoms. Uh, we can just go ahead with what we did. Next. Uh, yeah. So, we decided to place a fully covered uh, SEMS in this patient. Um, a guide wire was passed across the structure and a 15 centimeter fully covered esophageal stent was placed and the position was confirmed on fluoroscopy. Uh, patient had initially mild discomfort uh, for uh, one to two days and then was discharged back home. Uh, okay, Any, now just a question, now there are a lot of questions in the chat box about this as well. Any thoughts on early placement of fully covered stems for potentially refractory structure? Say you have a corrosive patient and you know this patient's not going to um, do well, which we realized. Uh, th there's been some thought about putting it earlier versus waiting for another 20 dilation and then saying, hey, now this is not working. Should do it. Dr. Dua, any timing preference? Yeah, you know, it's interesting that way back, I think it was in the 70s or yeah, I think so. The corrosive injuries in children was treated by putting in a bougie and mm -hmm. keeping it in place so that when the corrosive injuries, so it was a blind bougie uh, with a thread tied to the nostril of the kid so that it was sitting in the esophagus and uh, the kid was being fed from a different route. And it led the area to heal around the stent before they pull that bougie out. And that's how, this was the time when we did not have any of these uh, expandable stents, et cetera, et cetera. And the first literature on stents for corrosive injuries earlier on before the remolding happens uh, was from the pediatric literature. Uh, I tend not to put the stents earlier on in these patients. I like, like it to mature and see what we have as an end product before I decide that they can go for fully uh, covered stents or not. Of course, it's a no brainer if I am dilating them and I have a big perforation, I go and put in a stent there. So if, if you can get away with uh, frequent dilations, uh, I would shy away from putting a stent earlier on and use it only as a backup plan. Yeah, okay. Next question. <clears throat> How long? I think studies have placed for like two months. Would you prefer to please place it for longer or just two months is fine? I know at times even two months is too long. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bapa, Dr. Philip, you guys place it for longer or not? I think six, six to eight weeks is the max. I don't think patients tolerate, these patients don't tolerate stints that well. Yeah. They do encounter a lot of pain, they have to kept, uh, be kept on analgesics around the clock and they don't tolerate these stents that well. The other thing with stents is, you know, stents, these stents do tend to migrate and, you know, the nightmare is not just the migration, but if the stricture reforms on top of the stent, the stent is in the stomach and now you've got a stricture in the esophagus, 
and now you're committed to pulling that stent out through that stricture area. And that's the biggest nightmare. And that's why we reserve stents for really refractory ones. I agree with Dr. Dua, that's not our first, you know, go-to kind of a solution here. It's not that easy. I would still prefer my, to dilate and yeah. steroids and other things. My, my, my bigger question is that uh, whether you keep it for six weeks, eight weeks, uh, whatever the recommendations in your own practice, what do you do after you pull it out? Do you bring the patient back for dilations? Do you let the patient go high and dry and call me if you need me? What do you do? What's the when you pull it out? I'm talking about now. The, when you pull it out, it is nice and open. You go in. There are all the skid marks of the stent on the patient's esophagus. Your scope goes through into the stomach. Now, what do you do? Yeah, there are strong believers of uh, self dilation in these. You know for uh, corrosive strictures and that is the once you pull out the stain that is the best time to motivate the patient for a self dilatation protocol and get them on, uh, enrolled onto the program and if they do self dilate then probably they have the best result because these strictures are going to come back whether three months or six months later they are going to come back unless we keep dilating them if the patients can do it on their own probably they don't need to come back to us but otherwise then we need to do them do it yeah, I agree. Okay, no, thank you. Okay, uh, suturing. Well, we'll skip this question because I think it's cost prohibitive for most patients in India. Uh, I think we can skip it, not pertinent to the case now. Just move so, forward. Three yeah. days later, the patient came back uh, and complained of dysphagia. Uh, we did an endoscopy which revealed stent migration. Uh, it was very difficult to pull the stent uh, with the rattle forceps, so hence we had to. Uh, reposition. Uh, we had to completely pull out the stent and reload it, and then put it back. And uh, the patient was asymptomatic for ten weeks. Uh, ten weeks later, uh, he underwent stent removal. And this is the picture post stent removal. Mm -hmm. uh, well uh, open uh, esophagus with a lot uh, significant amount of blood, but patient was clinically fine uh, immediately after the removal of the stent. Uh, again, after two weeks, the patient came with recurrence of symptoms and uh, on follow-up, this time we did an endoscopy and we found there was a tight stricture again uh, at that area, which was not negotiable uh, on an, with the passage for passage of adult endoscope. The patient underwent uh, dilatation, a boogie dilatation uh, over the guide wire. And the uh, video on the right side is post dilatation in the same patient. Okay. So as, as I mentioned in that uh, study on wound healing, fibrosis sets in two weeks, epithelization takes five weeks. This is the classical situation where two weeks later, the mucosal barrier that was broken by the stent led to fibrosis and the epithelium had not enough time to grow back to prevent the stricture. So I would have probably brought him back in one week to dilate him prophylactically mm -hmm. and rather than leave him for two weeks because that's when the fibrosis sets in. Yeah, interesting. So this time again, patient ended 15 sessions of dilatation uh, every two to three weeks. Okay. Uh, My we, body. Yeah. we had the team discussion and uh, we, uh, Dr. Naikwade would be explaining the rest of the surgical part now. Actually, uh, it was a very reluctant surgery as such because uh, already patient had multiple problems, had one perforation, left-sided pneumonitis recovered, then uh, his uh, nutrition was, uh, uh, had gone down, uh, uh, already gastrojejunostomy was done. So we were reluctant, but uh, in last 10 to 12 years, this was the first case uh, which we had to go ahead with the uh, surgical option of uh, esophagectomy in uh, corrosive stricture. Now we were prepared with uh, uh, colonic conduit, uh, had uh, given good colonic preparation prior to surgery, but we were very really, uh, much worst with doing transhiatal esophagectomy with uh, stomach conduit. So, uh, looking at this big stomach, it was option with us whether we possible to get, get ahead with uh, stomach conduit. So, on expiration, uh, only problem was with esophagus. Stomach was very well uh, preserved and very large stomach. 
gj was at very down side that is anteropylaric region so we were able to uh, get a good stomach tube and it was uh, easily uh, reach up to uh, cervix so uh, in the cervical region so uh, by giving neck incision we had anastomosis in the upper part in the neck uh, we want to avoid any thoracotomy we want to avoid any chest infection because uh, we thought that he may have a lot of problem with recovery so it was transhiatal esophagectomy uh, without opening the pleura and having cervical anastomosis we had kept trials to across the anastomosis uh, corrugated rubber drain beside the neck so because we were expecting some leak in this patient because of poor nutrition uh, feeding jejunostomy was done in the efferent loom of gastro jejunostomy site uh, we got good amount of stomach below diaphragm so we left out rest of the thing at is it and we came out uh, by completing the surgery so he had leak uh, minor amount of leak i will say so it was managed very well after 3 to 4 weeks of giving feeding and it was resolved uh, patient okay, resolved. yeah patient patient also developed right sided pneumonitis which for which he received iv antibiotics and uh, recovered well uh, on follow up after uh, uh, can i make a comment yes, yes uh, doctor yeah thank uh, you sorok can i make a comment please 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 do we, we, the two important uh, things i must i must congratulate you on your good surgery <clears throat> now the two uh, things we need to discuss is there a need to remove this corrosive uh, this uh, esophagus or not this is an area of controversy because the reason for removing it is people say that it can become malignant And but so. thus over a long term and the number of cases is less and sometimes this esophagus can form a mucosal though the mucosa is destroyed the problem is that removing this esophagus is very difficult because unlike normal cases where you can do a transhiatal in a patient who has corrosive so many endoscopic procedures a leak a blind esophagectomy is a dangerous option you could do it that's all right but if you do it these days it's recommended to do under thoracoscopy under vision so that we do not cause any damage to it so but you could do that so now and this substantiates the fact that in this patient you could do it but if the stomach was problematic you would have to take a colon which is an inferior conduit as compared to the stomach but i think you could manage it well and that's congratulations to you now oh, thank you Yeah, we are touching nine twenty nine, so we should uh, yeah. go through the case file. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, patient continued to have dysphagia. Uh, eight weeks post surgery, uh, an endoscopy was repeated, and we found the patient had now developed an anastomotic side stricture, which was looking better than the previous uh, corrosive stricture. So, nine sessions of dilatations were done. Uh, his dysphagia improved. Liquids are more tolerated than solids, and patient now had significant complaint of recurrent cough with bile reflux. uh we uh, we thought this bile reflux could be due to the loop gj and uh, after giving lot of conservative treatment we went ahead and planned to uh, change the loop to ruin by uh, which dr naikwadi sir would explain again yeah it was a little bit uh, biliary stricture at the gastro jejunostomy side so we decided better to dislodge it because it is obstructive also and convert it into ruin by okay right good Thank you. Patient continued to have intermittent dysphagia, uh, but which was significantly better over the time. Last last dilatation was done in April 2019. That is almost three years after uh, the presentation. And uh, last follow up which we had with him was one year back, and the patient is clinically better. So uh, the take home message think, after this yeah. long. I think we can go ahead with that. There are a lot of questions, Ravi. So I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. management is uh, corrosive injury needs a multidisciplinary approach, as in our case. patients both from the patient as well as doctor is very important serial dilatation is important seven uh, uh, weekly dilatation is more uh, useful in this case as we have learned now and role of fully covered sems is still controversial surgical and endoscopic complications should be considered while prognostication the patient in the beginning itself thank you well thank you ravi uh, i know it's a little late maybe you can take a couple of questions if okay with the panelists um, uh, from the audience Now we can stop sharing. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, 
Saurav, yes. I think you know many of the questions are answered, but I think you know you should choose those questions we have not touched upon. I agree. And uh, there are there are some questions actually addressed to Professor Dua uh, regarding yeah. the use of uh, patch uh, of uh, right, glucose right. Uh, stem cell therapy and all those things. So, Doctor Dua, there's a question on. Uh, do these these sort of raw sheets adhere to the post uh, ESD mucosa? Don't they won't, won't they just saw, fall off? Yeah. The gravity by Dr. Tarun Bharadwaj here. No, in fact, it's the reverse problem. The moment they touch tissue, they stick like those those cello tapes. So yeah. when we apply the patch, we cannot take it freehand through the mouth into the esophagus. We have to put an overtube. It's again like those mitomycin C situations. We cut a two centimeter patch, put a biopsy forceps through the scope, hold the patch at the tip of the scope and make sure it does not touch any tissue. The moment it touch, it sticks. Wow. So that's the reason we put the overtube. And when you go down and you see an area and you touch it, it will just like stick to it. And you don't have to cover the whole area. You put uh, one patch on one side, other patch about a centimeter below if you have to, and they will interconnect very fast. So it's the other way that they stick so much that if you touch it at the wrong spot, you can't peel it off. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ramchandani, nice of him to join in. He says, uh, while cutting the short and astromeric picture, we have seen the cap of endoscope helps in stabilizing the scope, may prevent overcutting. Do I use the cap or you do it without cap? I, I I see Ram's point. I think it's a very good point, but I have got so used to use cutting without the cap that I I generally cut it uh, without the cap. You know, it it I when I'm when I'm cutting you you know it's it's like the it's not like a sphincter tome where you can flex and you can relax. The yeah. needle is out. I out. In fact, the needle is in the packet, very curled. It's made for the pre-cut sphincterotomy. So I first straighten it out completely. And when it comes out from the tip of my scope, the only way I can cut is moving my tip of the scope, which gets a little bit limited with the cap. Mm -hmm. So after I take it out, I want my scope to move freely so that mm -hmm. I can take my needle in various directions rather than get restricted by the cap. But I see the point of using a cap. I have not used it myself. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, Dr. Naresh Bhatt also asks from Bangalore, do you typically do a contrast study post dilation? Uh, routine patients, after you've done boogies, do you put contrast to check if there's perforation routinely? Uh, question no. for me? Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I, I always rescope them. Okay. I always rescope them, and yes, there could be a micro perf, but uh, generally, I'm more worried about over perforation. And uh, if I don't see any after my dilation, I don't send them for. I mean, at the slightest doubt, do it. But right. if I'm fairly confident, I don't. Okay, all right. I I think we can just end it. We are a little late now. It's nine thirty-five today. Uh, there are a lot of questions, but well. Uh, I can. I guess we can end it here, if okay with everyone. Thank you so much, yeah. all of you, for joining in today. It's a Sunday evening, and for two hours, uh, this is a wonderful session. Thanks, Dr. Dua, for a fantastic lecture, and uh, the panelists for their uh, wonderful experience and insightful comments. I guess we could have gone on with so many more questions and more discussion for another two hours. But uh, thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Bape. Thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adar Chaudhary. Uh, sorry we couldn't get you to talk more. <laughs> As we are a little late for the surgery. It's but, so uh, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> but thanks for so much to learn. So much to learn. Thank yes, you. and thank you, Dr. Philip, as well. Thank you, thank you for coming. And uh, well, thank you all for attending. We had a wonderful thank session. You. We are having more of these events in the near future. Some dates are yet to be announced, but next one will be on IBD on uh, June twentieth. Uh, we are trying to keep it on Sunday so that it's easier for everyone to attend. All right. Okay, we'll uh, end the session there. And thank you so much, Cook and uh, the team of Torrent. Uh, Velo's uh, team for uh, helping spread the word and uh, being co-organizers for this event. Uh, again, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Good thank night. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And congratulations. Yes. Wonderful session. Yeah. Enjoy. Yes. Thank <laughs> you, Dua, for this wonderful talk and uh, Saurya for organizing this. Mukhevar uh, for yeah, moving yeah. this.
Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you. Words, words of wisdom from Madhur Shyamadri. It was very interesting to listen to him, and yes. then it was a wonderful session. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. We'll just stop the session. Okay. Thanks.